Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Four decades in the business, Steve Dorff has written over 20 top 10 hits for pop and country artists around the world, including, get this list, Barbara Streisand, Celine Dion, Blake Shelton, Smokey Robinson, Kenny Rogers, Ray Charles, Anne Murray, Whitney Houston, George Strait, Dolly Parton, one of my favorites, Judy Collins, absolutely love her voice, Cher, Dusty Springfield, Ringo Starr, and Garth Brooks. He scored for such TV shows as Growing Pains, Major Dad, Murder, She Wrote, which my wife and I still watch on occasion, Reba, along with feature films including Pure Country, and the Clint Eastwood flick. She kind of seemed to have a, a precedent here. Honky Tonk Man, Pink Cadillac, and Every Which Way But Loose. He's a 2018 inductee to the prestigious Songwriters Hall of Fame in New York City three-time Grammy and six-time Emmy nominated. His songs have charted in five successive decades with number one records across four decades. And oh yeah, he's also the author of the book, I Wrote That One Too, A Life in Songwriting from Willie to Whitney. Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Bob. Thanks. Wow. You've accomplished a few things in your life, haven't you? I'm tired just listening to you. Um, (laughs) I'm tired of listening to me too. That's why you're going to do all the talking. (laughs) No, it's, uh, you know, it's been like we were talking before the show. It's it's just been such a blessed career so, of getting to work with some of the greatest artists and voices of this generation or really any generation. And I, I've been fortunate enough to have been able to keep it going and move through the decades working with some of the greatest talent on the planet. Let's back up quite a bit, if you don't mind. Uh, you were born in New York City. Did you come from a musical family? No, no. Nope. My uh, my parents thought I was from outer space. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, musicalizing everything since the time I could crawl out of the crib. And uh, if I got in my mom's car and the windshield wipers were going because it was raining, I, I would those windshield wipers would turn into a symphony in my head and. Uh, if one of my friends hit a home run in Little League, I would everybody would be cheering. I would be musicalizing the whole. You'd be writing a score for that. Yeah, I would, and that's pretty much what I did. And um, I would ask my mother or some friends, "Hey, ha- how did you hear that?" Because I just thought it was as natural as breathing, you know, like any one of the other senses. For me, um, musicalizing everything I did or everything that was around me would just. That's what I did. When did you start to realize that, hey, I can do something with this? I, I think I can make a living at this. I think, uh, I think one of the, you know, I'm asked that a lot. One of, one of the biggest turning points ever in my life, and I can still vividly see it, was I was seven years old, and we had a black and white small Zenith television, you know, and I happened to be passing the TV and Leonard Bernstein was conducting the New York Philharmonic and I was watching and listening and I said that's what I'm going to do that's what I want to do you know other kids see you know Mickey Mantle hit a home run or then uh, they go I want to play baseball or I want to play football or, for me that was it I wanted to conduct the New York Philharmonic and so from that point on I started to Listened to records, you know, of course, as a teenager and started writing really bad songs. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I think that was my path. And I always knew that. 
Bernstein as a musical influence? Oh, I think that now. That style I, of I music? Think, yeah, I mean, I was uh, theater music and movie music was huge for me. I, I loved that because that's what I did. I was underscoring everything I did in my life. So when I got the opportunity later to actually do scores for television and film, that was easy compared to writing songs. You know, writing songs was like, God, you know, that's that's a lot of work. But But looking at a at a scene, looking at a car chase, looking at a rainstorm. That's what I had done my whole life. So it was very easy for me to do that. If you don't mind us jumping around a little bit, because no. I want to come back to the songwriting aspects of, of your career. But let's talk about when you say scoring for television or film, do they give you that visual body of work and say, okay, here's what it is, yep. or do they come to you with an idea and you you kind of scribe it out, or how does that song come together for that piece of television no, or I film? Get the, I get the, the film, the, the edited, hopefully the final edit, so that what I write and what I create doesn't have to be changed. I mean, that happens all a lot, too. Right. It's a whole different set of musical muscles that you're exercising, you know, from writing songs, because there are no lyrics, there are no set time signatures. It's it's kind of a blank palette, really. When I'm looking at a at a piece of film, and conjuring up what the music's supposed to be doing under that picture, whether it's a love scene, uh, a brutal murder, a helicopter chase, that. I'm hearing what what I'm visualizing the picture to sound like. And so uh, there are no constraints, really. You know, there are no lyrics to be written. It's just orchestral. Who were your musical influences growing up? Was it more of a, a pop field for you? I yeah. mean, it, you, some of your biggest successes in country, obviously, but also in pop. But who did you listen to growing up? Burt Bacharach. Wow. Yeah. Dave nice. Grusin. They were my uh, heroes, musical heroes. Backrack was my, you know, probably my biggest influence. Oh, the songs that he wrote were mm -hmm. just amazing. Mm -hmm. But I loved a lot of theater, you know, writers too. Julie Stein, um, Rogers and Hart, Rogers and Hammerstein. I remember as a kid growing up, my dad really didn't understand me when I would listen to Sick Grand Funk Railroad or Jimi Hendrix. He always made sure that I also listened to Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and Henry mm -hmm. Mancini. There were many nights we went to bed listening to that music. And I look back now, and I think it shaped me musically to where it got me where I, I wound up being. Is there one in particular that you think really kind of just pointed you in that direction? Or is it an amalgamation of all of them? Yeah, I think it, I think it's a combination of... Everything, you know, uh, there was a lot of theater music playing in my house. And, and so, you know, Broadway shows. And that's really that's really what I listened to most of the time. And then, of course, when the Beatles, the Beatles hit and the British invasion, that that totally set me on the path to writing pop songs, you know, and, and determining that, uh, yeah, I want to make I want to make records. I want to make records that sound uh, that sound like that you know one of the things you mentioned before we got on the show was that you set your sights your goals of being able to write music and really represent yourself to other artists out there that that's that was your goal that was your mm -hmm. hope was to be able to to write music for them but in order to get there, did you have an instrument that you learned how to play? I mean, did you take piano yeah. lessons or yeah. guitar lessons? Or? No, I'm self-taught, but yeah. uh, keyboards, piano was my instrument. I, I started playing very young, three or four. My sister was nine years older than me, and she took lessons and would practice the same song over and over and over till everybody in my house wanted to hang themselves and so I would uh, crawl up on the piano bench and, and play it better than she could that so, had a score points with your sister well she tried to break my fingers and, uh, <laughs> um, but no um, I never took lessons um, again I, I had this rare gift or whatever you want to call it I, I kind of heard I if I hear something I can play it so yeah that that was uh that was kind of my, my upbringing was just listening to all 
a, a mix of, of classic, you know, Sinatra, Dean Martin, Perry Como. That's who my mother loved, you know, so I would hear those songs. I think songs. all of our mothers did, yeah. Yeah, and, and it was, uh, they, they were... Uh, they were the pop stars of that era, and and for me, I never uh, aspired to be an artist or a singer. Uh, I knew that that uh, you know I didn't really feel confident about playing in front of people. Whenever anyone relatives would say, "Hey, sit sit down and play something," I'd go. Eh. So for me, it was all always about writing the songs for these great artists that that were my favorites. You know, back when Hullabaloo and Shindig and those shows started in the in the '60s, in the late '60s and '70s, I, you know, Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck and Petula Clark, the Righteous Brothers. You know, I would say, yeah, I got you know Paul Revere and the Raiders. You know, um, I got to write for all of them. So for me, it was like, holy, you know, uh, how, how did that happen? Because that's what I set out to do. Hey, this is Gary Chapman, and you are listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us, and it affects our everyday lives, whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, Steve Dorf is sitting across the console from us here today. Right before we took the break, you talked about that you got this opportunity to start writing for these people. How did that first opportunity come about? Well, I didn't really get the opportunity. That was just my dream. Yeah. That was my uh, self-imposed uh, destiny. You know, uh, I would listen to Petula Clark, and I would listen to the Righteous Brothers, and I would listen to these voices and and so I'd start writing songs thinking, ah, oh, I'm going to write something for, you know, I could never get my songs to these people, but I wrote them. But somehow you did get them. Some, yeah, it's, you know, I, I describe it as, uh, because I've had this conversation many times, a big part of my career and my success has been Manifest Destiny. I've willed things to happen. And I, it's not just something I do. I, I, I think anybody is capable of doing that. You have to, you know, you have to make things happen. If you, if you sit and wait for the phone to ring, it's never going to ring. I had this strange feeling that if I willed it enough, something, you know, close to what I was hoping would happen. And I've just been lucky enough time and time again for that to happen. The first door that opened for you to get your foot into this business, do you remember what that was? Well, I was, yeah, I was in high school going into Manhattan. I grew up in New York and Queens and uh, going in on uh, to try to have my songs heard. Of course, I went to the Brill Building and by the time I got to the Brill Building, there were only dentists in there. You know, all the music business had moved to the West Coast. I loved arrangers. I loved the instruments of the orchestra and the records. When I listened to a record, I would I wouldn't 
necessarily listen to the singer. I, I would listen to the production. And there was this guy, Herb Bernstein, who was one of the hot arrangers in New York. He did the Cow Sills. He did uh, Lauren Nero. He did the Tokens, uh, the Four Seasons. I found out where his office was. And I was 16 years old and I knocked on his door and he had an assistant there. Herb wasn't there. And I said, I'd love to play Mr. Bernstein a couple, couple of my songs. And the guy said, play them for me. And I did. And he said, don't go anywhere. And he called Herb and he said, you need to come in and listen to this kid. He's got a couple songs. And that, that was my, I would say, my first break. I mean, he paid me $35 a week to write songs. I had to get my parents to sign the contract, you know, the songwriting contract. Got my first couple of songs recorded by him that he he produced. And that was the beginning. Wow. Yeah. And then you wound up on the West Coast. I did. Was that an easier time for you in the business or? Yeah, that's where, that's where it all really blew up for me. I was a session player and an arranger for a well-known producer who had moved me to the West Coast to, to kind of do what Leon Russell had done for him for years, a guy named Snuff Garrett. Right. He produced Sonny and Cher and Gary Lewis and the Playboys, uh, Sinatra. I mean, he, he produced a lot of people and he gave me the opportunity to uh, arrange and play on those sessions where I started to meet other great players and other other producers. And uh, and that kind of got me in into that inner circle of uh, where the records were being made. And, and eventually I would meet the artists and by playing on some of their sessions and uh, Always had a song in my back pocket if uh, if anybody needed one, and um, and they did. Was there a a particular artist that you were writing for stylistically wise, or were you just I'm just going to yeah. write for whoever right. can pick it up? I just try to, I, and I still to this day I just I don't think about artists. I I just try to write the best organic song I can. And then hopefully someone uh, wants to record it. And sometimes the song gets recorded by the wrong artist. And, and in, uh, in many cases in my career, it's taken years for a song, once it's been recorded by someone, for it to be hit by someone else. And because I always say that the key to having a hit is that marriage between the right artist and, and the right song. Perfect example might be I Just Fall in Love Again. Yeah. That was actually done by... Karen, f- Karen Carpenter first recorded it. They yeah. didn't put it out as a single. Right. Uh, Dusty Springfield heard it, called me, loved it, said, I'm going to record it. She recorded it, didn't put it out as a single. Anne Murray loved Dusty, heard her version, said, we're going to cut this song. And they did, and that was the hit. Dreaming must be dreaming Or am I really lying here with you Baby You take me in your arms And though I'm wide awake I know my dream is coming true Again, just one touch, and then it happens every time. And there I go. I just by then you were beginning to wonder, or did you were you <laughs> eternally optimistic? Um, I knew it was a really good song, and and uh, and and those other versions were incredible. I mean, Karen's, all of them, Dusty. I mean, they were they were my. I worshiped Dusty Springfield as an artist and later on got to work with her, uh, got to produce uh, several things with Dusty. Um, but yeah, for the songs got to be, you know, another perfect example, especially for the country market is uh, Bette Midler recorded I Cross My Heart. And it was not a good version, you know, and, and to her credit, I think she knew it and they left it off the album. I played that song for everyone I knew for the next eight years. Wow. And everybody passed on it until Pure Country came along and 
uh, we got George Strait to do it, and he had one of the biggest records of his career. Pure country. How did? Oh, well, let's let's back up even a little before sure. that because. Mm-hmm. Talking about your influences and in, in the pop world and the Sonny and Shares and the Carpenters and mm-hmm. and Dusty Springfield, then all of a sudden you find yourself in the country music yeah. writing world. Well, I grew up a Jewish kid from Queens, New York. Uh, I I didn't see a tree until I was fourteen, so I, I couldn't really spell country, <laughs> <laughs> and and never listen to country music. I didn't know Merle Haggard from. Uh, Willie Nelson. I, you so know. you really had no no influence to guide you one way or another? None. Snuff Garrett was a huge country music fan. And um, even though he was making pure pop records, his dream was to start to work with country artists. Because he grew up in Texas. That's all he knew. He loved Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. He used to talk to me about that. And I, I didn't know what he was talking about. So when Clint Eastwood's movies came along where Snuff was musical supervising, uh, they were primarily country artists, uh, that genre. And so he started uh, asking me to write songs that, you know, for, for those projects. And, uh, and then the country artists like Eddie Rabbit and Charlie Rich and Merle Haggard and uh, Frizzell and West, who we had a lot of hits with, they became the major focus of Snuff's uh, stable or genre. And I just listened to a few country records and said, oh, yeah, I can do that. You, you make it sound easy, was it, that transition? Yeah, because it was, uh, for me, the writing of the songs was the same. It's it just was, still telling a story. It's, yeah, it's, it's the same process for me. Yeah. It's the same exact process. For me, I think what makes something country or R&B or pop are the artists. They're the ones that really influence the arrangements and influence the production, influence the the way the players play, the arrangements, which I, which I said. That's a, the artists are a huge uh, influence on that. And so obviously when uh, if you have if you have a great song and Whitney Houston's doing it or Merle Haggard's doing it, if a great song's a great song. In the studio with us today, Steve Dorf. Hi, this is John Barry, and you're listening to the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Are you curious about Gordon Lightfoot's songwriting process or what it was like working with Prince in the 80s? Have you ever given any thought to what goes into a golf course design or writing a book? I'm Steve Waxman, the host of The Creationist, a podcast about people who create. Each episode features a different creator sharing stories that I hope will inspire your own creativity. The Creationist is available now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio, sitting across the console, Steve Dorf is with us today, talking about great songs. We can't finish this conversation without at least discussing Through the Years, mm. which was the number one hit for Kenny Rogers. And you did a co-write on that with uh, Marty Panzer. Marty Panzer. Mm-hmm. When you wrote that song, did you know it was going to be that big? No. <laughs> I I never, you never know, because some of the songs that I've had big hits with, I'm not particularly crazy about um, and didn't think they would be anything. I kind of wrote them because I was asked to write them. And then there's songs like Through the Years or I Just Fall in Love Again or I Cross My Heart that that I know are really kind of special. And then you just hope that the right artist records them. Through the years, uh, Kenny was the third artist to take a swing at that. Two other big artists passed on that. Glenn Campbell passed on it and Barry Manilow passed on it. Do you think it wound up in the right home with Kenny? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Kenny was arguably the biggest artist in the world at the time. Lionel Richie was producing him. He was coming off Lady. Lionel had actually heard through the years first the demo, which was just me at the piano. And Lionel loved the song and he played it for Kenny. I don't think Kenny was going to record it. From the story I was told, his wife came through the living room when they were listening and she walked over to Kenny and said, you're doing this one. I can't remember when you weren't there. 
When I ever cared For anyone but you I swear We've been through everything there is Can't imagine anything we've missed Can't imagine anything The two of us Turn my life around The sweetest days I found I found with you Through the years I've never been free I've loved the life with me And I'm so glad I stayed Right here with you So there you go. I mean, right place, right time, right moment, right song. Every Which Way But Loose. Was that, once again, one of those films where you sat and watched it and you go, okay, this is the song I'm going to write? No, not on that one, because that was the first film I ever got to do. And I kind of backed into that. Uh, I was asked to write the song uh, at the 11th hour. Uh, A big artist world-renowned artist had written the song for that movie and Clint threw it out at the last minute and they were going into post-production going to go back and refilm certain segments I got a call to write a song called Every Which Way But Loose I had no idea what that meant and I called my friend Milton Brown in Mobile, Alabama who knew country music I woke him up because I was in L.A. He was in Mobile, Alabama. I said, uh, we got to write a song. He, he answered the phone. He said, somebody must have died. That's That was how he answered the phone. I said, no, we got to write a song. He says, good, call me tomorrow. And he hung up on me. And I called him back. I said, no, we got to do this now uh, over the phone because I've got to play it for Clint Eastwood in the morning. And uh, I won't tell you what he said. I won't say what he said. But we wrote that song in 30 minutes over the phone. Um, I said, all I know about this movie is it's a guy who drives around in an old beat-up pickup truck with an orangutan, and he beats people up. Great. Great idea for a song, right? Uh, And uh, Milton wrote the lyric, and we wrote the song over the phone. And uh, I went in the next day and played it for Clint and Snuff, and uh, they loved it. Clint said, that's the song. And we got Eddie Rabbit, who was very hot at the time, just really rolling in the country charts and uh and the rest is history yeah we got eddie eddie to record it yeah and that was my first uh first number one projects you're you're working on now you're obviously from what i understand doing some piano orchestra concertos yeah i'm doing uh, i'm doing a wide variety of stuff now which is really fun uh, i did I, during this pandemic i had 10 months to work on something that i've always wanted to do uh, and never really had the time to do, and that's a piano orchestra concerto. So I finished that, and hopefully when orchestras come back, maybe in the fall we'll uh, have a debut performance you know, with, a, with an orchestra somewhere here in the States. I'm working with quite a few young artists, which is really fun. A band of three brothers uh, named uh, the Bass Brothers. They're known as Essex County. I'm we're making some really cool records. I just finished producing uh, another band called the Nash Villains and uh, on kind of an outlawish sounding record, working with um, several female artists because that's that's primarily what I do. Is uh, I've worked with just about every diva there is. <laughs> so uh, Liv Charette is one from Canada. Uh, Rachel Wamek here in Nashville, I did a track with her. And then I just finished um, a duet, very exciting project, a duet with uh, Barbara Streisand and Willie Nelson. That will be uh, be out sometime, uh, they tell me, April. What was it like to work with those two? Well, I've, I've been very blessed. I, this is my fifth song uh, with Barbara Streisand. And what can I say? She's, she's absolutely incredible. You know, greatest greatest female artist of all time 
I didn't personally get to work with Willie. He did his vocal in in his studio in Texas. It's it's quite a quite a cool cool record. And Keb Mo. Yeah, I'm working with Keb, which I forgot. Uh, yeah, Keb Mo's incredible. We we co-wrote two songs for his new project. Working on that. What's next for you? Still writing films? Got some I'm film take projects? I'm going to take a um, nap. <laughs> uh, no, still writing. Uh, writing. You know, I'm trying to trying to write a song every every month or so. I don't prescribe to the the writing. You know, two songs a day, and right. uh, I've never been able to do that. I, you know, I write when when uh, when an idea hits me, or if there's a co-writer that I've uh, wanted to work with, and we'll get together. And if if something inspires us to come up with something is there an artist a a singer an entertainer out there that you haven't written for or you haven't worked with yet that you'd like to yeah yeah there there are a bunch because you know every year the new great voices um i would love to uh have a chance to work with cc winans she's on my top of my wish list josh groban uh, came real close with a song with Josh that uh, didn't happen, but I'd I'd love uh, love to have one with him. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Cece's a local girl, so yeah. you should be able to. Well, it's you know, it's you know, artists have their own camps and their own. You know, it's it's uh, it's not easy. It's never easy. It never gets easier. And people can find your book that we talked about earlier. Where can they find that at? Uh, they can find it on my website, stevedorf.com, or they can find the audio version on Amazon. And that was, uh, yeah, I'm very proud of that. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound designed by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.
You still here? It's over. Go home. Go.